Avatar Maya Barber, QJ. I um, haven't put together a lovely talk as Robert gave us, uh, but I've assembled some things which have meant a lot to me. And I was given a cue by Sim that what uh, he'd like to hear at any rate is how uh, being with Francis shaped my life. So a lot of that is quite personal, but I've, I, I've actually just made a list of things that often crop up in my mind <coughs> that were phrases that Francis used or um, something that he said that helped me in my life, such as you see. Don't blame him for me. Uh, I was born in 1941 and my father was a dear friend of Francis's, as you've heard from various other people. And uh, for my uh, first birthday, he uh, wrote a poem and gave my parents for me a book. And um, I'm going to read you the poem. It's not a, um, an important poem, but this is before, long before, Francis's contact with Barber. This is when he, he was writing but had not yet heard of Barber. It's Little Song for Joanna Bruford. Now, it's not crying. What, 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 what you need to understand about the tears is that... With, with Barber, anything to do with Barber or Francis, they opened up uh, for me such a panorama of experience that was so way beyond our everyday life that it affects, getting glimpses of that panorama affects me emotionally inside. And I'm sorry, you, if you, if, if I, you get tears with me, I can't help it. Even Barber in 1962 said to me, why are you crying? And, and I said, Barber, I'm very happy. <laughs> and he just left it. Yeah. Anyway, this is little song for Joanna Bruford um, in 1941, the year I was born. The children sang, standing beside the rose and the cyclamen but mostly beside the lily of the valley and the beds of geraniums. And their song was that the dawn had come into the garden because the garden was of the dawn and the dawn loved to come into her and enjoy her beauty. And the children sang and were very happy because they stood in the day. And um, some of you will know that the study that I did later in my life was of horticulture, and there might be a seed. <laughs> um, and with that song, he gave my parents for me uh, a book. Now, uh, this is in my first year, of course, I couldn't read, but they gave it to me later on. And... Um, this is an illustration of something I was going to speak about later, but I'll do it now, is that Francis encouraged us to um, explore and uh, good literature, especially literature that had some real meaning in life. You know, um, one of the books that he encouraged me to read was The Desert Fathers, which was translations from the Latin about the early fathers in the desert, Christian fathers in the desert. And they are just such wonderful stories. And all through my life, he pointed to various books and said, why don't you read this? You know, um, I'll say something else about that later. But this is a book also, translations about the early fathers, the Irish uh, fathers, the, the monks in the West and the desert fathers. And it's called Beasts and Saints, suitable for children. There's not much spiritual literature for kids. And I thought I'd just read you a story just to give you an idea of the sort of thing he was feeding me before Barbara. The Unsociable Lion. 
There was a certain old man, a solitary, who lived near the river Jordan. And going into a cave because of the heat, he found there a lion. And the lion began to gnash his teeth and to roar, to whom the old man said, What is annoying thee? There is room enough here to hold both me and thee. And if thou likest it not, arise and go hence. But the lion, not taking it well, left and went outside. <laughs> I, anybody who's reading according to the uh, notes in the back of Stay With God will have come across the notes about the Desert Fathers. If you can't get a copy, I've got one. They're well worth it. Um, you know the story that Francis often used to tell us on digressing? I mustn't, but I'll just tell you this very briefly. The, the story of the in, the... in the desert, there were lots of hermit monks and they lived at a distance from one another and uh, quite a long distance. You know, it would take hours to walk from one cell to another. And they uh, spent their time in meditation upon God. And uh, there was a monk who uh, went into, oh, oh sorry, was visited by a friend from the city, um, Alexander or Cairo or somewhere, and the, the friend from the city brought with him a beautiful bunch of grapes and gave it to the monk. And the monk said, thank you very much, and they had a, a drink of water together and the city dweller went back to the city and have you all heard this story yeah. dozens of times? Yeah. And um, the, the monk thought to himself, oh, Brother John would really love these grapes. Uh, and so he put on his coat and he got his staff and he took the bowl of grapes and he walked a long way, you, you know, some number of miles, to Brother John's cell. And they sat down together. He gave Brother John the grapes and they sat down and had a cup of tea and a little bit of conversation or a cup of something. And uh, the, the original monk returned to his cell. Then Brother John sitting there and thinking, oh, wouldn't Brother Theo enjoy these grapes? So he, he gets out his coat and stuff and he sets up off across the desert. And that bunch of grapes went right round the desert. And with each giving, it increased in love. That's how Francis told, as I remember, Francis told us that story. When we were uh, children, Francis, uh, as I said, was in our lives. And uh, later on, uh, he went to live in uh, Camden. Uh, he was, he'd been with my father who was at the art gallery in Melbourne and they'd been mates there and got up to all sorts of mischief. But the thing was that my father recognised in Francis something very special. And as a child I picked up a sort of a respect for everything that associated with Francis. And I can remember standing in the back scullery, we had a kitchen with a sort of back kitchen in it, and I can remember standing on tiptoe at the window of the scullery, looking out into the garden, watching Francis meditating. And we, we tiptoed around. My mother would say, and, and, and he was sitting cross-legged in a meditative pose in the garden. All sorts of little, little things like that sort of developed our second-hand respect, if you like, for uh, Francis in our childhood. And another little thing um, I wanted to mention was that uh, Francis was um, always keen to balance the, the, the great stuff, the, the, the uh, special stories with fun and games. And um, uh, one of the things, I, I don't know whether I've told you this before, but one of the things uh, I think he observed in my brother and I, 
um, a little bit of self-consciousness um, in, in front of other people. And um, uh, so one day before we went out on a family picnic with Francis, he had got hold of my recently shorn off plaits and he stuck them with safety pins in under a, a tea cosy and put the, put, the, put the tea cosy on his head and... Flowers on the top of the tea cosy. <laughs> and... Melbourne 1940... Oh, heaven knows, yeah, 1940... Early 50s. Was it? No, no, it was... Yeah, okay. Anyway, um, we uh, set, dutifully set off in the car and we'd only gone one block up the road and Fran Francis said, oh, John, uh, just stop a moment, I want to post a letter. And <laughs> So uh, Francis got out in his regalia and uh, posted the letter and, uh, and Bert and I were sitting there like this. <laughs> you know, this is where we live, in Melbourne. <laughs> and, and, but to and, Joanna's and, horror, the posting box was outside someone in her same class at school. <laughs> anyway, we went on that trip and, and Francis took every opportunity to uh, get out and buy fruit or, uh, you know. <laughs> All, all that um, uh, kind of stuff. Um, this is out, in, out of a letter uh, from Francis after he got to India. I haven't arranged these things chronologically. Uh, in the first year that he was there, 1959. And uh, I'm just going to read you tiddly bits. He said, shh. Yesterday, someone in Pune had a birthday party and sent me to and sent over to Barber a bucket full of mango ice cream, which Barber dished out to us, four helpings each. And in the end, Barber picking up huge chunks of it and chucking it into our open mouths. <laughs> Isn't that a lovely picture? Yeah. Here's a little poem on the bottom of a birthday uh, message to me. He, he, he says to beloved Barbara's Tilak girl, of course, I, that's like uh, first hand and second hand love. That's because when Barbara was here, he gave me and Joni and Lorna some Tilaks to put on our forehead uh, as a gift from Mara. Uh, and, and God again took birth into the world he holds upon his palm. His word unto the earth shall rise to him as man's dear grateful psalm. Here's another bit out of, uh, this is 1960. Uh, I must have, we must have said something about, to him about uh, picking oranges. Uh, I think probably I was just um, telling him how happy I was to be able to work because I had so much trouble with my breathing. And uh, he said, I have a sort of love of orange trees. As a boy, I used to spend half the summers carting water for a young grove and hoeing and scarifying it. My great ambition then was to buy up paddocks that were used for wheat and sheep and turn them into orange groves to cre create areas of greenness amidst the terrible, monotonous brown. One of the paintings that we searched for for this exhibition is a painting that, that was in Robert and Lorna's house all through my childhood of a bowl of oranges floating over above an orchard. We unfortunately we haven't been able to find it so far. What I was saying was how he guided. I mean, I was only me, but he took so much trouble, even when he was in India, to bother to guide what I read. And here's an example: there is a book, Jean Christophe, and I tell you, anybody who hasn't read Jean Christophe by Romain Roland, read it. It's absolutely unbelievable. Uh, there is a book, Jean Christophe by Romain Rowan. It is a study in novel form of the development of musical genius and contains a lot of good material on culture generally, especially French culture. 
and I'll stick in there and the most fantastic love story. Read the second point of the world being in the condition it is, ripe as a boil ready for lancing. This was 61. Ripe as a boil ready for lancing. It will not mat matter, dear Jojo, where we are at the time, but how we are whether the picture of our own important self takes up all the room in our heart or whether beloved Baba's face shines there. Uh, here's just another sentence. Um, I've been telling him, I was working in Longreach, I'd obviously been telling him about some of my experiences in Longreach. This is another thing about my life with Francis. It was, I've, I, um, I loved the opportunity to communicate to him what was going on in me uh, and I, I don't think I rarely did that with my parents. I did sometimes with my father but an uncle, we called him Uncle Francis then, an uncle or an aunt is such an important thing in a child's life. Uh, you know, never think that, uh, yeah, even although he interfered sometimes and stirred where he needn't have stirred, it, um, it, it was really important to me to have that relationship. He says, all work, Jojo, is utter rot. Yet any work has its importance. A and it is a good thing for oneself to do a job as my boss at the time wants it done. And a bit later, but a few nights ago, the clouds cleared away and the stars shone so brilliantly. This is um, Puna. The, the clouds shone so brilliantly that they seemed golden. Since then, it has rained and the villagers have been sitting up at night singing. Singing is the great lack in our lives. So we have to have concert halls and radios and records so that the many can be entertained by a few and for which the many have to earn money, that is, expend labour energy to pay for it. Here everyone sings in some sort of a way. Even when they read a book of poems, they don't read them, they sing them. So, sowing all sorts of little seeds in my mind. This is 63. You speak of more faith and resignation to beloved Baba's will. Ah, uh, dear Jojo, it will be something when we just have some faith and resignation. In the meantime, for myself, I just try to please him a little. When he asked me to write an account of the East-West gathering, I didn't know which way or how. So all there was to do was to just start doing, trying to think and jotting down the feeble results of it. Somehow or other, the job got going. I suppose he must have wiggled his little finger towards me. And I toiled on and on. And then one day it was done. And beloved Baba seemed very pleased with it. All this boils down, dear Jojo, as far as I can as far as I am concerned, to the more one thinks about oneself and ways and hows. And the less forward, forward, oh sorry, the less forwarder one gets. But the more one thinks, just thinks, mind you, not loves or has faith or re, or resigns about beloved Baba and does things for him, something does get done. Now you are really reading books underlined. I am very happy that you have enjoyed the Odyssey immensely. One's enjoyment and such of, of such an immense book 
must be immense or nothing. Also that you have been reading, stay with God. For, dear Jojo, I write for the young of which you are a member. I said something about this, I think, in the householders, adding, the old will not, not like my song. To them, I say, peace. I work very hard at my writing, and it is indeed pleasure-giving when I hear of it being studied. So on, on that score, I'm just uh, Robert uh, mentioned uh, I was given the opportunity to help Francis with some of the notes at the back, and he had me read enormous books to find one quote. And, but it was just wonderful. I read the whole of the Kashpal and Majub and I, um, a whole lot of other really wonderful uh, books. So I had a wonderful time doing that. And the other thing that I had the enormous um, pleasure of doing was helping to uh, proofread Stay With God. And we'd learnt a little bit about proofreading from Robert. And uh, it, it was just wonderful. You know, I'd, I'd walk around on the, in, in that time with lines from Stay With God singing in the head. That's all I'm going to read you out of those let, letters. I was thinking of what Sim had said, um, how Francis had affected uh, my life. And so I thought I'd just tell you just a few things that often uh, occur to me. One of them was, Francis often used to say, never miss the opportunity to call Maya House by the name Barbara gave it, Maya House, because he was, he was chastising me because I would refer to Maya House as Beacon Hill. That's what we knew it as, as we were children. You know, we'd gone up to Beacon Hill or we'd gone to visit um, Beacon Hill. Never miss the opportunity of calling it Maya House. And the same with Avatar's abode. He gave it the name Avatar's abode. None of this AA business. This is in no particular order. Uh, one of the things that he often gave me to understand, I, I'm not quoting him, and this is what he's given me to understand, that it's very important, whatever your thing is, whatever you want to do, to achieve any results, although he didn't say to achieve any results, whatever you want to do is do a little every day of that thing. You have to keep working at it. It doesn't matter if it's just a little bit, but do a little every day of what you want to do. And don't sit around waiting for inspiration. Just keep working. He emphasised work, work, work. And he also emphasised participation in the arts. But in the back of that was train your memory, which I failed to do. Uh, <laughs> Train your ability to strictly concentrate. He would say, you must learn to think. He would often say to me, he'd pull me up when I was a child, he'd say, you must learn to think. Think, really think. And behind that was the um, implication that you had to stop, still, and allow silence and then really think, you know, train the, you, your mind to actually be able to um, work through the process of thinking. I was talking to Joy the other day, Joy's not here, Joy was um, telling me some of her lovely memories of Frances, but one of the things she said would, she, um, was Frances would often pull people up and say, never say Barbara said this or that unless you can absolutely be sure that you're giving an accurate quotation and you know the context and time for that quotation. Say you understood Barbara, well, no, I'm now adding. Um, we can always say we understood that Barbara said this or meant that, uh, unless we've got the real exact quote, don't be careful. This is a bit personal, but Francis would quite frequently complain to me, this is after I've grown up a bit, about my parents. He, <laughs> and 
he would complain about the fact that they were not giving me or hadn't given me a proper education, meaning that they didn't feed me good books and that we didn't talk about the books in the family. My father would have uh, really objected to this, but then he would have said, and I say also, that that's what Uncle Francis was there for. <laughs> Francis, uh, yeah, he, he recommended music for me to listen to and all of that stuff, I've told you that. Uh, and then when I was young, every now and again, he, he, um, the subject would come up of sort of uh, what one could spend one's life doing. And uh, the matter of choosing a career, although it was never really couched in those terms. But he sowed in my mind the idea of... Um, uh, it would be a good choice if you could be useful. And what does being useful really mean? You know, so in my young mind, I went through all the sort of different occupations that a, a girl could have, and which of these was really useful. And it's a very good sort of, this is an example of the way he sort of uh, would sow an idea and trigger in you a whole lot of quite, um, deep thinking. He, he also emphasised, uh, and all the young people who used to work with him um, on the property around here, those the youth that you were referring to, would know that he he emphasised the um, that work should be val uh, balanced by rest and by play, and um, uh, and. There, there was always, you know, you, you might get an idea that Francis was serious, but there was always, you wouldn't from Robert, but there's always uh, fun and uh, recreation. And, and he also emphasised, uh, you know, being strong, uh, strong and fit to do whatever work you needed to do. He loved ping pong, and uh, once he rode my bike, a girl's bike that wasn't full size, all, all the way from our house in East Malvern to the Dandenongs. And, I, you know, it's possible, I don't know this connection, but I suspect that Bernard and I have been boasting about riding our bikes to Elwood, which was, um, you know, it was an enormous ride for us, but... Uh, uh, nothing compared to riding to the Dandenongs. In other words, um, uh, come on, <laughs> you need to be fit and strong and um, uh, he was going to show us how one could do that. I don't know where he went in the Dandenongs, that was secret Francis business. But, yeah, that's right, really very hilly, yeah. Here's an example of just how um, incredible, when I look back, how incredible it is that he took such a part in my life. He came to my 11th birthday party. All girls, we, we, we went to, um, I must have said I'd like him to be there for him to come, but we went to um, uh, some beach on Port Phillip Bay and uh, Francis was there. And he, he didn't just sort of uh, spend time on me, he sowed a few ideas in some of my friends' heads too. And, and it was just wonderful to have him there, you know. Fancy taking the time when you're... When you, um, uh, to me, that's a bit like the story of Gohair and the Chooks. Do, do you know what I mean? That Barbara took such... Um, interest in the mundane as, as, as well as the, um, uh, the big stories of God realisation and all that. He, he took care of, the, of how go ahead looked after the chooks. It, looking back, fancy Francis taking the time to come to my birthday party. And one of the best things about uh, Francis, of course, which I'm leaving out, I'm leaving out, I'm just leaving out heaps and heaps and heaps of wonderful stuff. But anyway, one of the best things about being with Francis was that he would break into a story at the drop of a hat. 
and it was just like sitting with Eric in Munderley Hall, just, you know, it was just so wonderful to hear these stories, which went beyond my experience and showed me worlds beyond anything that I could imagine, so that I knew that my life going to school and all that stuff uh, was, you know, only a tiny bit of what it was all about. And uh, the fact that I, uh, I don't think the idea of following came into my mind at that time, but uh, the fact that my family were involved with an Indian guru, Maya Baba, was so odd in those times, I mean in the, in the 50s, uh, but it, the oddness never touched me uh, because of this world that I, that I knew was out there because of my association with Francis. You know. Going back to the literature thing, Cecily reminded me how I'd often told her this is a spin-off from Francis in other families, that when I was staying at um, Maya House uh, and the, with the LePages, Bill would sometimes we'd sit around that, that table in the old kitchen at Maya House where Barbara had sat and had meals and Bill would get out Monkey or some other storybook like that and because I was living there I got included in the family thing and he would read these wonderful stories and what a wonderful family sharing that was. Uh, as part of David's preparation for the Spring Sir Harvest he got in touch with people who couldn't make it here and one person, was, one person who responded very beautifully to David's request for stories was Noel Adams, who we heard from last year. And I was quite amazed to hear read Noel writing about uh, his mother, Clarice Adams, reading the Ramayana to him and, and his brother and sister in the same kitchen at May House you know, before, before us. And I, I'm, I'm really I respect the hand of Francis behind all of this. When Francis wrote to me, um, from India, uh, he always expected me to acknowledge receipt of the letter, even if I wasn't going to reply straight away, to acknowledge the receipt of the letter. And I must have been guilty of not acknowledging the fact that he had conveyed to me Barbara's love, because I got, on, in several letters, I got a big roasting about you really must acknowledge any any message that comes from Barbara. Can you imagine how dumb I must have been not to do that? But anyway, that's how it was. Same for me too. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to mention that very often the correspondent, correspondence with Francis wasn't all lovely and stories like I'm, I might have led you to believe, but it was often reprimands and uh, criticism, well, not quite criticisms, but um, pointing out um, faulty thinking and um, constructive criticism. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but it it was like uh, on a couple of times when I've been reprimanded by one of the Mandali in India. Even although quite often because he didn't really understand the situation, he got it all. Um, all wrong anyway, and I really didn't deserve the rebukes that I was getting, uh, or, or felt that I didn't. I always felt that there was something in there and that it was worth getting, uh, and I really looked forward to my letters from Francis. Uh, it was, um, uh, as my father once put it, we had a friend at court. <laughs> so it was, it was like, the, the possibility of um, uh, having an extra contact with Baba. And Baba would often send us those messages through Francis. And if we hadn't have had that friend at court, they wouldn't have happened. There was an occasion uh, here when uh, there was a parent with a child that um, uh, a few of us felt um, was not um, getting everything it needed. And um, some brave person, I think it was probably Roz, uh, went to Francis and said, look here, you better say something. And Francis said something which 
I'm always very conscious of, and uh, that is never forget the child chooses its parents. In other words, that the child's sanskaras that brought it into this world have also placed it in the right with the right parents. And don't lose sight of that. Don't think that you can step in to um, a situation and improve it. It may not be that you can. Yeah. That's my interpretation of what Francis meant. Uh, and I thought I'd just tell you one other little thing and then one, two little things. One of them was that I had a great, one of the joys of my life when we first, uh, after Baba had been here and we were still living in the farmhouse with the Rouses down there. Francis, uh, although he wasn't sleeping down there, he sort of lived there, his bed was still here, but he lived down there. And uh, his bed had been here when Baba was here. Uh, Francis slept underneath the tank stand here. I know because I used to make his bed sometimes. Uh, he, uh, so that he would be there if Baba called. The tank stand was where the toilets are now, yeah. And Francis had a little sort of cubby hole under there. Um, but anyway, uh, after Baba had been and uh, we were living in the, down there, I, I had all my life been quite intermittently quite sick with asthma. And one of the things that uh, used to happen was the, the time where I uh, got shortest of breath was in the very early hours of the morning. And uh, frequently I would uh, wake, having difficulty breathing, and I would have to get up. You know, lying down was always difficult. Uh, when you're short of breath, lying down is hard. And I would go out into the um, living room of, of Robert's house and Francis would have the kettle tinkling away on the stove. And uh, he uh, was writing on the table and he'd be having uh, cups of tea. But it's a really beautiful memory to share the dawn in silence with him. It was just lovely. As you know, the sun uh, comes up over there and we could see it all through the windows of the, ra the farmhouse, yeah. And the very last thing uh, I thought I'd say uh, is that year years ago, at one of the uh, anniversaries, after um, Tony and Maria had come to be uh, come into our circle of acquaintances. Um, there were a whole lot of skits put on that Francis wrote. And there is one line out of Tony and Maria's skit which is, was about marriage. Uh, there's one line that uh, frequently occurs to me and that is, it's very simple, his grace is in every moment that you remember him. Jay Baba. Jay Baba.